Hello everyone again. Welcome to another of our interesting sessions. Yeah, so again, a warm welcome to everybody this uh, fourth week. And uh, as I said earlier, we are happy that God has made it possible for us to witness Tuesday, April 27, 2020. And the course for today is ACE 812 for the master students at ACE 912 for the doctoral students. In this class, we have uh, about 80 uh, students and we, about 70% of them, actually 80% of our students are doctoral students and the rest, that's 20% are master students. The course is Advanced Trends in STEM Education and Graduate Seminar 1 and 2. Now let me tell you about this Graduate Seminar thing. After a series of the lectures, you will then, uh, each of you will then have to present the seminar. I uh, will give you maybe about 10-15 minutes to present either on a topic of your choice that is different from your thesis or dissertation or project report or something that is related to your story, maybe your proposal. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the outline of our work for today by way of agenda is as shown. Uh, I'm welcoming you now and I will introduce the facilitator who will then give a live lecture on indigenous knowledge systems, IKS within the context of delivery of quality STEM education. It will address us for about 40 minutes and then we'll have questions and answers, after which we will close the session and uh, that will be it. So, let's welcome our facilitator. Who is our facilitator for today? Professor Jofu Sarama Mensa is uh, a science teacher educator, uh, former vice chancellor, University of Education, Winneba, Ghana. University of Education of Winneberg, Ghana is the first university of education in the whole of Africa. And Professor Jofos Adam Mensa uh, is the Foundation Vice Chancellor, Director, Institute for Research and Innovation Studies, and Executive Chair of the Teacher Education in Sub Saharan Africa. He is a former Pro VC. See, the Pro VC, that's Pro Vice Chancellor, is the equivalent of the Deputy Vice Chancellor in Nigeria University. That's of University of Cape Coast. He was head of science education and dean of education of the same university. Professor Adam Amensa was director of science and technology in action in Ghana, STAG, which has now become the Center for School and Community Science and Technology Studies, SACOST. He's currently advisor, that's a key position, to transforming teacher education and learning is a government of Ghana project supported by DFID. In our center, if you come to our building, it's been recognized among all the science educators that we have in Africa to be one of those that we are showcasing. It's like a hall of fame. We have Professor Samtuni Baja, Professor Emmanuel Ayotunde uh, Yoluye, uh, Professor Osi Nwana. See, from here to here, Osi Nwana, Professor Osi Nwana uh, was born in 1934. You can see two. I'll talk about it in a minute. Sir Thomas Philipson, Thomas Bamanja, 1943-2. Jofus Adam, Adam Mensa, 1947 two. Now these two, they put two, three thousand, the year three thousand, that is going to be, the, for three to the year three thousand, three thousand, three thousand. Okay, so these are our great science educators. I'd like to dedicate this uh, presentation to the wife uh, of uh, Mrs. Beatrice, uh, to the wife of Professor Jofus Adam Mensa. Mrs. Beatrice Anawa Mensa, who passed on about a year ago, and I had the uh, singular honor and pleasure to deliver the first memorial lecture about three months, four months ago. That's the uh, 10th of January of this year. Uh, we remember her for her contributions to technology and vocational education in Ghana and the whole of Africa. There's a school that uh, she holds that is training high quality STEM educators uh, and Technical and vocational education, uh, education ed educators. Uh, we uh, we miss her, but God loves her most. May her soul continue to rest in perfect peace. So let me now. Uh, uh, okay, just a minute. All these people just coming in. Uh, let me now introduce to you Professor Jofus Arawa Mensa. To let me now welcome him. 
Now, on the plaque that we have in our center, we have Jofus Anama Mensa, a Ghanaian top flight science educator and scholar. He is an African leader in technical and vocational education and on cultural issues affecting science teaching and learning. That's what he will be gravitating on today. He's a household name in the Ghanaian higher education firmament. You go to Ghana, talk about Jofus Anama Mensa, everybody knows him. In sub-Saharan Africa, his footprints of quality science teacher education remain indelible. My pleasure to invite you, Jofus, to take the floor. But, but before that, I recall that uh, Jofus and I uh, passed across several decades ago, and uh, I also now carry memories of uh, my, our visit. My family and I visited Jofus, uh, and uh, Mrs. Beatrice Adama Mensa was a very, very wonderful uh, hostess. That was when uh, Professor Adama Mensa was Deputy Vice Chancellor of uh, the University of Cape Coast about 200 about 200 years ago. Now over to you, Jofus. Um, but today is not a time for this. So um, today I will just say that uh, if I'm describing you, there are three words: Afrocentric, great encourager, and great commitment for what you're doing. We so thank God for your life. Thank God. And uh, let me welcome all the students who are here from various parts of Africa. Um, this is a great uh, opportunity for all of you, you know, to be part of this uh, uh, interaction and the growing African co uh, collaboration and uh, uh, cooperation in ensuring that Africa moves forward. I'd like to start with this uh, 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 court, that would say that Ghana, like most African countries, had a viable and rich knowledge and meaning, meaning making a system that sustained the livelihood of the people even before Africa was colonized. Africa was therefore not devoid of knowledge or history. It had a holistic knowledge system that had been referred to in various quarters as indigenous knowledge system traditional knowledge, ethnoscience, and ethnobotany, and so on and so forth. However, with a rude interruption by colonialism, there is an unfortunate perception that portrays Africa as being knowledgeless, and this view is being perpetrated and continues to be perpetrated by new colonialist forces. Um, my presentation will just look at the impact of Africa's colonial history on STEM knowledge and production. Uh, I will look at the um, indigenous knowledge system, but then I will also look at other forms of systems that you know most societies have. And in our, in Ghana, in Nigeria, in other African countries, we have them. We have, and I will speak about them later on. I will then look at the um, case studies of uh, the start projects at UCC and then the um, SACOS project at the University of Education, Winneba, you know, which attempts to bring the, bring the gap between the, uh, the school science and community. So the coverage is this, um, look at indigenous knowledge and other things that I've said already. And I introduced this by saying that Ghana, like most African countries, is facing real crisis in development and utilization of science and technology in its attempt to achieve economic emancipation. We know that uh, STEM is a very valuable tool that needs to, to be uh, um, used by all countries in Africa for our development. We see STEM has done so much for the world, but it seems to me that it has, has failed to meet the development needs of Africa. If you look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, um, they all attest to what is happening in Africa. Increasing poverty, hunger, lack of clean water, energy, sanitation, quality education, name them all, one by one, and you find Africa in the center. This situation, I believe, is rooted, you know, partly in the historic development of STEM education in Africa. Uh, 
you know, throughout history, I mean, different cultures have different, you know, develop uh, different uh, views of the world. They develop uh, knowledge systems. They develop, you know, over centuries of, you know, experience with the environment, interpreting the environment in a way that will make them feel more uh, um, uh, uh, comfortable in living in their societies. You know, uh, but this body of knowledge, you know, as I already referred to, you know, has been given different names, including IKS and the you know, knowledge systems. You know. Um, but they all have their own peculiar implications. If you say but a local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, you know, they have their own implications. We're not going to pull into that. But I just want to use this definition for, for our uh, purpose here. Um, the indigenous knowledge system is a unique knowledge confined to a particular culture or society. This knowledge is generated and transmitted by communities over time in an effort to cope with their own agroecological and socio-economic environment. It therefore refers to the understandings and the skills and philosophies and all those things that they, they have developed you know, as part of their history in, in interaction with the natural surroundings. So, Areas like indigenous music, architecture, moral decorations, game toys, bead work, food, cultural artifacts, and so on. Herbal medicine, you know, astronomy, navigation, hunting, and they're all part of this. You know, a very very important part of it that they have sustained them over the years. You know. So if you look at some of the characteristics, like indigenous knowledge, it's local. You know. It is rooted, you know, to a particular place and set of experiences, and generated by people living in those places. You know, uh, more often, you know, it is indigenous. So when we talk about uh, uh, local knowledge system, it's more of indigenous or aborigines. You know, not descendants of migrants or colonists. You know, uh, but when you talk about the general knowledge system it tries to bring all these together. Whatever comes in to embellish or help to modify and improve on what is happening is very important. It is fluid, constantly changing and constantly being produced, being reproduced, discovered as well as lost. You know, it is therefore not static as some will want to look at it. You know, it's not static. And it's, it's a fluid system changing all the time. You see that, you know, um, the kind of things that uh, some of these indigenous people are doing, they bring in certain things, maybe from the modern science and so on, to uh, influence it. It is transmitted orally or through imitation and demonstration. It is situated within a broader cultural system. So it's part of the system. It is the result of generations of practical long-term interaction with everyday life, with the environment that they live in, you know, it's reinforced by experience that they get and the try do the things by try and error and, and change the system that is there. You know. It may be focused on particular individuals who tend to be seen as the specialists, you know. So certain herbalists, yes, for this man, that's what he does, and so on. So everybody knows him in the, in the place. As uh, it really associated with spirituality and you know symbolisms and so on. Um, but it is important that it has served as the survival toolkit to toolkit for many indigenous people over centuries. You know, it's really without their survival, who would not be around? You know, if they had not survived through all this, where would we be? It's interesting that I uh, just give two examples of some of the things that, are, you know, uh, there was a, a book uh, I'll, I'll refer to later on. And in 2001, the British lost 12 billion euros as a result of foot and mouth disease. And a large area was quarantined, just like we have uh, uh, COVID-19 now. At that time, the scientific knowledge was that the disease was spread, you know, 
by uh, direct contact with infected animals. But the Fulani cattle herders in West Africa had known for generations that the virus could be spread by the wind. So they kept healthy animals upwind of an infected one. And by partial immunization system, immunizing them by briefly, you know, placing them downwards, you know, on an infected head. You know, so they knew that, uh, you know, it's not only by, by uh, contact, it's also by, you know, the wind spreading it. Studies have also shown that the many farmers in Sierra Leone use sophisticated agronomic practices to mediate, you know, poor rainfall. The same in Nigeria, you know, where multiple uh, cropping and varietal experimentation to uh, mitigate against uncertain precipitation, you know, and high rates of evaporation. The Ngani farmers of uh, Western Kenya use traditional methods to, you know, forecast, you know, uh, uh, and they use the, the behavior of ants, birds, and so on, you know, the timing of trees, flowering, you know, they have very sharp minds, you know, in, in identifying those things that, you know, over the years, we've seen that, you know, it you know, suggests that this is happening, and so we, should, we need to do this and that. Ladies and gentlemen, Africa's dependency and underdevelopment has to be understood historically, as I said before, as a result of colonial domination and exploitation. Even the decades after independence of African states, the domination from the imperial powers continues to have its control over the economy, formal schooling, and knowledge production in Africa. As a result of this domination, national economies in Africa have been oriented to meet the raw material needs of the Western world. We have to produce the raw material and give it to them. Even our gold, we have to send it to them to refine and do all those things, you know. Um, so we we providing the raw materials. Similarly, as a result of the same domination, African academia is externally oriented, you know, to cater for the intellectual needs of the West. As such, not much research has been done to support the knowledge base of indigenous communities. Research taking place in Africa tends to address the needs of Western intellectuals than the research needs of their own country, thus making most of Africa's knowledge production externally oriented and externally directed. The intellectual production from African academics serve as intellectual raw materials for academia abroad to sharpen their theories or construct new ones from their own perspective, not the perspective of the African country from where the documents uh, were produced from. On the flip side, the theories produced abroad are imported to Africa, and we become committed and loyal consumers of these theories and theoretical frameworks. Just as economically, we become ardent consumers of things that are made in the West, you know, made in there is better than made in Nigeria, made in Ghana, made in, you know, Rwanda, and so on, you know. These stories do not take into consideration the complex social cultural realities of the place where the data or raw material is coming from. So what is the effect of this, uh, you know, sidelining indigenous knowledge that we have? you know, on knowledge production. The knowledge extends in the society and germane to it is ignored by both the African academia and their Western colleagues who view, whose views from, who view from a, a, a Eurocentric perspective, the cause of the strong hegemonic influence that local academia normally fail to recognize. So instead of developing our own theories, we use theories from the West to understand our own complex culture. And they may be a problem there. We need to recognize that African science and technology uh, is 
is, is, is unique and rich with its own particular worldview, which is different from that of the West, but no less important than that of the Western side. We need to recognize that. And uh, 20, you know, gives us this to think about. He says the world process of knowledge production entails marginalization of the old elements of knowledge and know-how, along with their steady withering and impoverishment. And in the worst case, they are sheer disappearing and vanishing out of people's conscious memory. So if we don't take care, some of the things that have you know, kept our society going over the years, we've lost them. We we'll forget that, you know, sometimes I ask people, you know, uh, we used to play some games on the seashore, you know, uh, and ask young, 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 young boys and girls, you know, uh, when you go to the seashore, what kind of game do you play? You know, I mentioned the game, they haven't even heard about it. You know, that is something losing our culture, losing something that has survived over the years and has made Africa what it is. What is the impact on STEM education of ignoring you know, uh, this initial in the, in the knowledge system? Schools served as the grounds for socialization into Western science and technology values. Colonial education isolated learners from their communities and infused in them colonial values, customs, attitudes, and knowledge systems. Schools ignore the cultural environment and the knowledge system, and it's, you know, uh, and and this has been referred to by many, including Jagadi and others, you know, many other people, as cultural subversion and cultural imperialism. Cultural knowledge was seen as an obstruction to school learning, including STEM learning. You know, uh, you don't talk about cultural things in a classroom. Majority of students fail to relate school science learning to their own problems and the problems in their community, and thus fail to exhibit ownership of school science that they have learned. Only a few students succeed, therefore, in this decontextualized school system. And students, some students tend to disown their own cultural heritage. They don't think we should talk about culture things here. We are in the Western world, in the modern world. So there's an aura of fear of science and mathematics which has been created amongst many students. This has led to the flight of the youth from these subjects. And I, you know, just, you know, so few years before, you know, where we, Ghana went on the uh, free SHS system. Um, the, Enrollment in elective STEM subjects in the senior high school was only 11%. You know, and it ran from 2017, 2018. You know, uh, and it's unfortunate that uh, this is what we want our children you know, to learn you know, and to study. But you know, um, look at the percentage of those who are there. Those doing business and so on, 45 percent, 50 plus percent. We are the arts people to it, 55 percent. No. Uh, so you wonder what is really happening. So there's a yawning gap which exists between school science and community knowledge. Many prominent African scholars, including Utonji, Ali Maziru, and others, you know, have expressed dissatisfaction of why Western science is accorded legitimacy, while indigenous knowledge is devalued, marginalized, and devalorized. Well, this was serious, you know, despite the systematic cultural annihilation, African traditions of knowledge have persisted and resisted, transformed themselves, and survived. And survival it's so strong to the extent that when modern medicine sometimes fails us, we resort to herbal medicine for relief. So 
we need to be mindful about the forces that uh, are, are threatening, you know, the IKS from the minds of our people. You know, neocolonialism, globalization, modernization, you know, decline practitioner base and so on and so forth. Uh, what is the urgent need to break the yawning gap between school science, STEM, and the cultural context of students? To make STEM relevant, interesting, and community and student friendly. When it's community uh, friendly, you know, it allows the community to be part of the science and technology STEM, you know, uh, uh, revolution. They also learn, but they learn from their context, you know. So that becomes very important. We also need a new pathway for conducting research which is not extravagant, but sensitive to the peculiarities of the community uh, knowledge and having potential to understand, interrogate, validate, and assimilate the different components, including Western knowledge, and integrate them into mainstream ways of doing research and formulate paradigms and theories to support them, our own theories and paradigms, to support them. That's uh, a kind of thing who says that when you get lost, you find that you are lost. Then go back to the familiar and start from there. You know. So when you're going to start, we are starting from there, you know, from what we do, what is familiar to us and to our people. And in noise, uh, in noise uh, paradigm shift, you know, that's interesting. Also, access to Africa's education problem have all too often been sought elsewhere. Now any paradigm is being adopted. Answers to Africa's education challenges exist in and must therefore be sought first of all in African context. In other words, in preparing for reforms as well as for their implementation by the ministries, Africa is where the relevant knowledge and the responses will be found. No longer you know, just a place where solutions from elsewhere are applied. So in doing this, we wanted to know the views of teachers about uh, uh, indigenous knowledge and so on. And we found and how science concepts they have learned in school, you know, fits into the wider jigsaw puzzle of uh, factors which facilitate production of goods in industry. We have very little knowledge about that. Science teachers lack awareness of the STEM concept associated with everyday items they buy. You buy toothpaste, you buy, go and drink beer, you do all kinds of things. These things, where do they come from? How are they made? You know, simple things, but you know, what are the major components? Science teachers do not also seem to appreciate the same concepts in the indigenous knowledge practices. Neither do they, uh, are they also aware of the, the knowledge that comes from informal, informal sector and then at formal manufacturing you know, practices. We need to recognize also at this point that there are other forms of knowledge which add to the indigenous knowledge system. And in any society, in any uh, country, we have all these. We have the manufacturing knowledge system. We have the uh, informal knowledge system. We have the uh, um, indigenous knowledge system. And we have the, the modern science. What is the informal knowledge? You know, uh, I'm sure you are all aware of that. You know, the vast store of knowledge owned and applied by small scale, uh, unregulated, and often family owned artisanal businesses operating uh, in mostly in the in the, uh, in the uh, interface between formal and indigenous knowledge. Now, this knowledge is associated with a well established institution of uh, knowledge transfer and skill formation. You know, you go to an uh, informal. Uh, sector, and you have to go through some training, apprenticeship before you are uh, you will pass out. You know. 
Um, <clears throat> in Ghana, it is summed to about 80% of the total workforce, and in Africa, the same. And 70% are women you know, in this informal sector. I think that's that's very important for us to to, to look at. You know, if most of our people are there, you know, what this is, and they have that kind of knowledge, what can we do? Yes. Then we have the formal manufacturing knowledge, the supplied knowledge owned by uh, medium to large scale industries that are based on modern science and technology knowledge. You know, so. Uh, they are the big industries that we see in our countries. You know, uh, what is the knowledge? You know, do we even go there to find out? You know, what kind of knowledge they are, practical knowledge they are operating over there. You know. Then we have community knowledge. Ten more you know, minutes. Ten more minutes, uh, Jobs. Ten, Ten more minutes. minutes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Community knowledge really, you know, summarizes the whole thing. Uh, it's the, it includes all the knowledge that I've talked about, you know, about. Um, so um, these are underlying assumptions that go with it. I, I will skip this one. Um, you can read it later on. We also, you know, these are all assumptions that we had, you know, um, guided us. And then we looked at the, you know, in very simple terms, uh, the comprising indigenous knowledge and Western science. But there's this model of integration, which brings all of them together. Indigenous knowledge system, formal and manufacturing system, informal knowledge system, and formal school STEM uh, system, you know, uh, which is underpinned by contextualization, you know, the fact that the knowledge is contextually you know, situated. You know. So we have this, you know, where the only integrated model where, you know, all the various knowledge systems are there, but they are not interacting with each other with the school system, you know, which is the main uh, issue. You know. Then we have the integrated one, you know, uh, which brings all of them together. And this is intentional. We need to be intentional in doing this. And uh, uh, it's, it's a constant flow, right? it's a fluid system, and constantly changing as a result of changes that we okay. Um, so, so start projects uh, started, and then um, the result of the start project is that uh, we had, you know, the mission was to bridge the gap between science and practice in the school, and that practice in this uh, formal industry. And this came out because uh, the government was interested in relevance, you know, of STEM, and uh, and therefore uh, in, the, in the 1987 curriculum review, they made sure that. Uh, science, technology, and society became a major issue that they should confront. But the teachers were, done, uh, were, were, were not very comfortable with it because they didn't have any, they haven't been taught on how to do it, you know, and so on. And so um, they needed support. And start project was uh, one of the things that was done. Uh, so, uh, so we brought industrialists together we brought, uh, you know, and and that's not just anybody from industry. We wanted the the, the chief or the uh, the deputy director of the industry to be there. Initially, there was a problem, but you know, later on they agreed that yes, I think something that can do for their, their country. You know. So um, I'm going to this. The vice chancellor of the university became one of the chief critics for the materials. You know, so this, these are the material sources that we produce. A teacher's resource book called the Science in Action, a resource book for science uh, teachers, has about 17, 18 uh, industries uh, there. And then Science in Action, a, web, a student's workbook, that was also produced. Um, then the center, the SACO center, you know, which was what, really the transfer of uh, uh, the start project to, to the University of Education when I went to the University of Education. Um, and the idea was to try and also break the gap and so on. Uh, so, um, uh, and then I promote awareness of communities in knowledge and its integration into the global knowledge of science and technology. Uh, some of the publications include blacksmithing, you know, and then for the junior, secondly, you know, produce something like how palm oil becomes magic, you know, simple cartoon system that uh, you know tells how 
you know, this becomes that, you know, reading for them, and that is good. So we have things like beat, beat making, uh, palm canal oil extraction, leather tanning, pinky making, herbal medicine, and so on. Uh, um, games and toys, and so on. Uh, some of the pictures are here. You can see them, uh, leather making there. And this is uh, um, a seminar, you know, a workshop that was organized for, for teachers, science teachers. You know, they visited various spaces, you know, and then uh, ask questions and develop their own science concepts from those things that they were uh, they were seen and being described by the uh, operators. Um, and then this is a school, a senior high school, uh, home economics class. That's um, one of the teachers who came to do uh, the workshop you know, went and started making pinky in the, in the school to the students, you know, how to make pinky, you know, uh, and those are the things that are there. So <clears throat> we had a plant medicine, you know, seminar with herbalists and so on, the games and toys that were produced. Four minutes um, more, four minutes more. Four minutes more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What mathematics are coded in the Kentic plot design? You know, uh, so we look at things, you know, traditional, what are the mathematics and science concepts in them? You know, the games, the draft that we play, you know, what are the mathematics concepts, you know, in them? We need to, you know, look at them. There are many centers in, in, in now, you know, dealing with uh, uh, the knowledge systems and so on. And uh, some of them have listed them here, including the, the great one, the cultural, techno, uh, contextual approach. Uh, by our revered professor, uh, um, which is now taking roots here. And I think that is something we need to all support. You know. uh, the Lincoln School in Science and Technology, University of Swaziland, I went there to support them to, to establish it. So I'm hoping that uh, you know, uh, C, CCTA will, 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 will be able to also do, do something like that. You know, go, help other African countries to set up something close to that. Yes, so what next? Sensitize science teachers and the general public about the importance of community knowledge. Uh, engage academia in research activities that are introverted, you know, that's that seek to understand and the, the uh, uh, underlinings, STEM concepts, the, the lines and concepts and principles in community knowledge. They develop teaching and learning strategies for promoting the use of uh, community knowledge in the classroom. Um, identify and describe the different systems, especially information and com uh, knowledge within 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 the surrounding community. Um, promote integration of community knowledge and so on. Uh, um, engaging, and this is very important, we need to engage with the ministries of education and health, the particular ministry of education to develop, you know, uh, you know, some programs that can support integration of uh, uh, community knowledge in STEM, you know. Uh, and uh, this, I said that this is especially important for the African elite who are nurtured in the womb of imperialism with a mentality that is in disharmony with African cultural values, but are now in power, in positions of power in every sector of the economy, you know. So we need to convince them that uh, they need to pay attention to this. And I'm getting to the end. I'm hopeful for, for the new attention being given to community knowledge system in Ghana, you know, uh, especially herbal medicine. Uh, last, uh, in October 14th, April 14th, April 4th, Prince of Health uh, in Ghana made a, a request to the Center for Plant medicine research in Ghana, for them to evaluate, you know, uh, herbal medicines produced by traditional and alternative uh, medicine practitioners for the management of coronavirus uh, uh, COVID epidemic. You know, I mean, that's, that's I, I see that as a great movement, you know. Uh, it may not end up in anything, but at least giving recognition to this, you know, uh, pleases me in my heart. And then this young man, you know, completed DHS and uh, uh, it's not working, 
but uh, uh, you know, works with uh, welders and so on, you know, decided to, you know, produce a, a solar wash, you know, for, 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 for the country, you know, for people who want to wash their hands. So there's a sensor there. So when you just put your hands there, you know, the, uh, the, the soup starts coming. And then you wash your hands for about 20 seconds. And then the water now comes to clean your hands. And then you go. You don't touch anything. You no. Know, and then you go. You know. So, um, and this has been, you know, uh, accepted by uh, the National Standards Board. You know, that, yes, this is something we need to replicate for various communities and so on. So, I end with this conclusion. African studies and research systems, including STEM education, to look into our rich, creative, and cultural background and rekindle interest in African knowledge systems, so as to make the younger generations aware of the achievements emanating from our continent and impress on them their inherent creativity. And this is from Tabo Mbeki. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, uh, Professor Jofus Anama Mensa. Uh, you have given us a very rich uh, uh, dose of uh, a very rich menu on indigenous knowledge systems within our. So, talking about indigenous knowledge systems, there was somebody who uh, talked to me yesterday and said that by looking at my teeth, uh, she's able to know that I eat more meat than fish. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, Jokus, <laughs> let me look at your teeth. I'm going to tell you first to look at your teeth and also tell you. So indigenous knowledge, we have knowledge, you know, uh, that uh, pervasive in the area. So at this point, ladies and gentlemen, we have, uh, let's see, yeah, we have 12 minutes. Let me open the, Bela Yi is raised his hand. Uh, let me call Bela Yi to uh, take the floor. Bela Yi, you have the floor. Just one minute, please. Yeah, one minute. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Billy, you take the floor. Yes, thank you very much, sir. I think you have gotten enough KK this morning from our professor. My question is based on, I hope you can hear me clearly, sir. Very yes. clearly, yes. Yes, sir. My question is based on one of the things that you mentioned in this slide. You said uh, research taking place in trace uh, some Western intellectual work. But I tend to disagree with this because it would be very hard for an Africa who has not even traveled to the airport eh, to start thinking about that. And if that is the case, eh, I think the issue has to do with we believing in whatever we propounded or we invented. Look at the case of what I have the single pressure you mentioned. I know quite a Quite a number of us will be, believe, will be saying, is that possible? In last week also, in Mozambique, uh, some group of students came up with uh, a medicine or a vaccine for the COVID-19. Instead of looking at it critically, we tend to uh, to cross the bridge. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Uh, 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 Messi B, I, I saw that you are sending a message, but you need to ask her. Uh, I'll take you later. We want many more people other than the same set of people. Uh, Michael Ige, uh, Adibayo Muhammad, you take the, you, the two of you take the floor and make it very quick. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning, sir. I want to appreciate the uh, distinguished professor. But, sir, I have a question. If we take Lagos State, for example, we have different culture. How do we blend this different culture into the curriculum because in your slide you mentioned about training of teachers to know about the curriculum with this different culture how do we blend it into the curriculum to make it an whole view thank you sir thank you so very much uh <laughs> Ige, you know I, I i'm not going to preempt what uh, our professor would say you know he talked about it context so you have Lagos, you have Badagri, Professor Aube is there. You know, the Badagri, Badagri people, let's assume that they are different from the uh, Bejuleki people. So we're talking about context. It's not that we're going to have one size fits all. You know, that's why in a school or in a context, you take the context where 
you are located and draw from the culture of that context. But I don't know what uh, Professor Jofo Salam Mesa will say. Yeah, yes, talk, take the floor, uh, Alibaba. Okay. Um, good morning, sir. Thank you very much, sir, um, for a wonderful lecture, sir. Uh, my question is more like an observation. Um, you said we need a new pathway. We need a new pathway. Now, from my own point of view, I believe um, in our high school, our curriculum is so wide that we tend to like um, we we chase flames instead of killing the fire. Why am I saying this? Um, there are some subjects we offer, like um, data processing, which is still an aspect of computer. I wonder why we still do that. Um, another example is um, catering crafts, which is still an aspect of food and nutrition. So what I'm saying in essence is, if you look at British curriculum, sir, you observe that even at the junior level, their STEM is so narrow. That's why you have subjects like just English, math, science, and any other subject. And that's what you write in your exam. The science is combined as physics, chemistry, math, which makes it very easy for them, for their STEM, for STEM education at that level. So that's just one of it. The okay, second uh, one is... Uh, uh, that's fine, that's fine. About, we can, we can uh, only allow you one now uh, because of our constraint of time. But that's a very beautiful question. I tell you, okay. uh, Professor Anama okay. Mensah will answer that. So let's take... Uh, 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 let's see who is next. Uh, Elijah, I'll take you later. Uh, do we have anybody from Burundi to, or from DRC or from Ghana? Uh, uh, Fred, make it very brief. We have just six minutes to end this. Fred, take the floor. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, sorry, your your audio is not so good, uh, Fred. You, sorry, your audio. Sorry, your audio is not so good. Wait, okay, sorry, audio is not so good. Can you say it again? Yeah, his audio is not good. Can you hear me now, sir? Right, we can hear you now. Your audio was bad the other time. Yes, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, so I, I was just saying that uh, they, it's a good presentation, but I, I think that to... Uh, Foster all of what we've been doing, especially regarding Afrocentrism. We must make Africans uh, to a lot of conferences, and there are a lot more of Western theories are, 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 are reported than our own. So, if there are indigenous knowledge systems, let our West always be the benchmark so that we can add some from uh, the West rather than always taking so much from the West and then dotting it with uh, Africa. That's, that's just my opinion. That's wonderful, my wonderful. So, uh, <laughs> Professor Akitola, maybe you. you you send a message just now. Maybe you want to you uh, express it to the class, and then we will take uh, all other job. We should make ask only one question, and then we'll end the thing. Sorry, Adi Wale, we don't have that time. I only have uh, five minutes. Yes, Professor Kola Rahim. No, you are presenting on May twentieth. You can say that I have only five minutes more. So <coughs> I'm so sorry, please. Uh, okay, we can see all other job. Take the floor. Thank you very much, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank you, Professor, for the presentation. Why are you standing? Why are you standing? But go on. But I'm just informal joking. knowledge, informal knowledge and community knowledge. Why? I can't speak distinction, sir. Can you please make clarification? Okay, thank, thank you. you. That's all. Thank you very much. So let me ask uh, Professor Jofu Sanama Mensa in uh, three minutes. Please respond to some of these observations. And if you cannot, uh, we'll send uh, a mail to, the, to, to them after you will have. Uh, Thank you very much, uh, um, Peter. Um, let me start with the last one. Um, the difference between uh, informal knowledge and uh, community knowledge. The informal knowledge is the knowledge that uh, prevails in the informal sector of the economy. Um, it is uh, the, those artisanal things that, that are happening and people selling things all over the place. Uh, the community knowledge is the summation of all these knowledge systems and its attempt to bridge them you know, to, into, to school science so that they can become a holistic and ongoing uh, uh, knowledge system for the, uh, like the indigenous knowledge systems you know, for, the, uh, for the community. Um, the, um, the question by um, uh, Adibayo I think that one is the, the fact that uh, the, the syllabus is overcrowded and so on. Yeah. Yes, you know, we have overcrowded curriculum. Uh, Ghana has, has, has now thrown down 
this curriculum, um, you know, from the kindergarten to, you know, the senior high school. So um, we have few more concepts, but then we we using what is called, you know, uh, um, uh, instead of objectives, we using standards, you know, uh, certain standards which, uh, you know, uh, uh, people can then aspire to, you know, instead of just uh, uh, using the objective phase. So, so um, uh, I believe that uh, if that is done, it will solve some of the issues that you have uh, uh, in mind. Um, the other issue was uh, to deal with how do you blend um, the, Yeah, one minute. Can, can, you, can you address that in one minute and wrap it all up, uh, Joe? Yeah, yes. No. Um, yeah, okay. okay. I think Peter has already um, uh, mentioned that, but especially what we do is in a textbook, you know, that we develop, the textbook, you know, will look at, you know, the different cultural systems and bring examples and so on to depict the area so that, you know, people are not disenfranchised, you know, and just looking at, you know, uh, a particular Thank you. Uh, larger culture and so on. Thank you so very so, much. Thank you so very okay. much. Uh, Joe Fox, okay. that's uh, quite brilliant. Uh, brilliant presentation, extra brilliant responses to our questions. Uh, it remains for us now to appreciate you, and I would like to invite the Vice Chancellor of the Tai Shulari University of Education. You were Foundation Vice Chancellor of the University of Education, Winneba, the first University of Education in Africa. And I'm going to ask our Vice Chancellor uh, the, uh, from the University of Education in Nigeria, the first University of Education in Nigeria to make a presentation for uh, very good. Thank you, sir. Yes, you have the floor. Yes. Uh, well, uh, let me join all the participants, all of us here, yeah, to um, congratulate and appreciate uh, our pre presenter, uh, distinguished professor, your first, Amal Mamesa, um, for the brilliant presentation. Well, I'm not surprised uh, being the vice, vice chancellor, former vice chancellor of the University of Education. Uh, <laughs> well, Lagos State University, Africa Asset Center of Excellence for Innovative and Transformative STEM Education, World Bank supported project. This is to certify that Professor Dufos Anam Khamensa facilitated AC812 and AC912 April 27 to May, May 2, 2020. Signed, Professor Peter Okubukola, our fire director. Thank you very much. Sir. Congratulations. Thank you so very much, sir. Thank Professor Aribo so on our behalf. <laughs> uh, today <laughs> is indigenous knowledge systems and uh, how to be compliant with the, the theme of uh, this presentation. Uh, I'm sure some people, some people are jealous of my cap. Some people are jealous of my cap. But I is jealous of my cap. I can see that he is. <laughs> Let me see all, all the others. Uh, today, will is also jealous of my cap. I can see those. Oh, <laughs> Professor Samson and Wow, from Botswana. Well done, sir. Well done. Well done. We really, really thank you. Yeah, I, I don't think they use this kind of cap in Botswana. That's why I won't call that you are jealous of the cap. Now, Professor Anthony Kola Lusonya. Yeah, he's using resource control hard today. And uh, yeah. So, the overall idea, ladies and gentlemen, is to. Uh, be compliant with it with it with the season with this time uh, maybe tomorrow since tomorrow is not uh, indigenous knowledge <laughs> i'm going to put on a non-indigenous knowledge attire so let, let me uh, ask all of us to give a round of applause to our presenter brother jokes thank you thank you very much jokes thank you one and all uh, uh and we'll see you tomorrow